unit test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a visa officer and an applicant. You have 30 seconds to read the questions first. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Visa Office. How can I help you? Good morning. I'd like to apply for a visa to Australia, please. Certainly, sir. I'll just get a form and then I'll need to take some details down. OK, here we go. Right. Can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Akamura. Kelly Akamura. How do you spell that, please? K E double L. No, no, your family name, please. Oh, sorry. It's O K A M U R A. O K A M U R A. And your address? Apartment 106, Kingston Street, Hawaii. Kingston Street, Hawaii. Yes, that's correct. So you're an American? Actually, I was born in Japan, but moved to Hawaii six years ago. And can I have your age, please, Mr. Okamura? I'm 32. Uh, are you married? Yes, I am. My wife's Chinese. And will your wife accompany you to Australia? Yes, she will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And will your wife accompany you to Australia? Yes, she will. In fact, that's the reason we want to go. Her sister lives in Sydney. And do you have any relatives living in Australia? I used to have an uncle, but he died several years ago. Now there's only my sister-in-law and my wife's cousin. So the purpose of your trip is to visit your wife's relatives, am I correct? Well, not exactly. Mainly because I have my own training company and I will be looking for business opportunities. Although I do want to do some travelling as well. You know, see some of the sights, that sort of thing. Although I don't intend to work in Australia. And your wife? What will she be doing? She'll be studying English. She wants a student visa. And how long do you plan to stay? About one year, I guess. Well, I'm afraid a standard tourist visa is only valid for 30 days, although in your case, we can issue you with a business visa. Business visas last for six months, but you will be able to renew it. We can give your wife a 12-month visa, though. Six months is OK, so what do I need to do now? Come along to the office any time during weekdays, but it must be office hours. We close at 5.30 and bring along two passport-sized photos and your passport, of course. Your wife will also need two photos, so that's four passport-sized photos in total. OK, thank you for your help. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two first year engineering students discussing their project on devices which have been specially designed for use in developing countries. First, 
Look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and decide which four planned developments are mentioned. Hi Aileen, thanks for coming. No problem. We've got our presentation coming up on Tuesday, so we need to get everything prepared now. Yeah, so we're agreed that we're going to concentrate on these two devices which have particularly helped people in developing countries. Yes. And we'll present the information in the form of a table, so it'll be really clear for non-specialists. We'll have three columns, you know, using the headings we discussed in the last seminar. OK, I've got those here. I'll make notes. So, let's start with the clockwork radio and how it works. We'll obviously say how it's powered, i.e. that it's wound up. Yeah, and we'll also need to explain how the energy is stored. OK. In a spring. Fine. Keep it simple. But we also need to say that the thing which makes the mechanism so special is the inclusion of a gearbox, you know, which makes it possible to release energy extremely slowly. Mm. And that means that it can operate for a long time with minimal effort. OK. Now, the next section is what are its benefits? I suppose we just need to emphasise that it costs a lot less than radios which use batteries. And if we want to, we can explain that these can cost as much as a week's wages in some parts of the world. Absolutely. And related to that, of course, is the fact that people don't have to depend on buying anything in a store, which in remote rural areas is really important. Mm. And then in the developments column, I think the most important thing we need to say is that the combination of the wind-up mechanism with a solar cell means that during the day it runs on the sun's energy and you only have to wind it up when it's dark, which makes it a much more attractive option. And that's probably that for the radio. Yep. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. So we'll then move on to the solar box cooker. And again, let's keep the description of the mechanism very simple. We need to say that it uses sunlight rather than conventional fuels to cook food. But we also need to explain two elements of why it's so efficient. Yeah. The fact that sun's rays enter through a plastic cover. Mm, better call it a lid. I thought it was made of glass. Mm, not according to my research. Mm, OK. And then we just say that light is transformed into heat and... Because it has a longer wavelength means that it gets trapped. And so it cooks the food. Good. Right. And then where do we begin on the advantages? <laughs> There's so many. I suppose we have to begin with the fact that you no longer need to cut down trees, which brings a whole raft of other benefits in its turn. Mm, sure. And related to that, I think we need to say that because dung is no longer needed as a fuel for cooking, it can be used as a fertiliser. Which leads to better harvests. And then there's the fact that there is absolutely no smoke. I was reading somewhere that there's a huge incidence of lung complaints, especially among women and children who have to breathe in smoke from conventional cookers. So that's another plus point. Yep. And then we need to say something about the way cookboxes have been improved. I think we can emphasise the fact that a reflector is often added at an angle to the lid to maximise the amount of light entering. Yes, good point. 
And also, I read about the fact that the floor or base of the box is raised, which improves heat retention. Oh, and I think we should mention the fact that many of the new boxes have a sloping or inclined lid, which increases the surface area to capture the sun's rays. Yes, that's a good point to finish on, I think. So, I'll write up that table on an OHT if you like, and we're all set for our presentation. Yes, great. If there's anything else that you think we should discuss, you know. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Listen to somebody giving a talk about how setting goals can help you achieve more. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see that so many people managed to make it. An achievement in itself when I'm sure you're all so busy. This evening, I'm going to talk with you about setting goals and how setting goals can help you understand what you really want to achieve. First, though, I'd like to start by saying what I think achievement actually means. I think some people think it's simply about being successful in a job or making money. But it certainly doesn't have to mean that. Achievement is simply accomplishing goals that you set for yourself, doing what you plan to do. And people might plan to do all sorts of different things. Achievement is about realising your dreams. I would also like to say that to achieve, you must have belief. Belief that you can do whatever it is you want to do. There is more to achievement than simply wanting to do something. Anyone can say that they want something, but actually getting it is not so easy. To get it, you must believe that it is yours. Not having belief is the main reason that so many people do not achieve. If you really want something, you must talk and act like you already have it. Then you have belief and then you will achieve. So, goal setting. Goal setting is about imagining the future and then turning the dream into a reality. Setting goals helps you to be clear about what you really want and helps you concentrate on getting what you want. Setting goals will help you see what is stopping you from knowing what's important. And because achieving goals makes you feel good, you will be more confident and succeed more easily. Goal setting is something that all achievers do, whether they are high flyers in business or successful athletes. It is important that you set both long-term and short-term goals. First, you need to have an idea of what you want from life. I call this the big picture. Then you break this down into a number of smaller goals that you need to achieve in order to achieve the overall goal. As I say, the first step is to see the big picture. Think about what you want in the next 15 or 20 years. Doing this will influence all the smaller goals that you set yourself. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. You need to think carefully about different areas of your life and how they influence each other. You should identify the important areas of your life and try to set goals in each of those areas. Here are the areas that most people want to focus on. But remember that everyone is different. First, think about your career. How important is your career to you? Do you want to be a manager or run your own business? Or are you happy working for other people? Connected to this is the financial side of your life. What sort of income do you want to have? Is wealth important to you? You need to think about long-term relationships. At what age do you hope to be married? Do you want to have children? How much time do you want to spend with the people you love? You need to think about your health and how that could change what you can achieve. How will you stay healthy as you get older? Do you do anything that is not good for your health? And how will you try to do those things less or stop doing them completely? Finally, you need to think about your free time, your hobbies and interests. How much time do you want to have to do what you really enjoy? It is difficult to achieve goals in one area if you feel that you don't have the time to do the things that really make you happy. Now, when you have this overall picture, try to set yourself one goal for each area. Make sure the goals are what you really want and not what you think other people want from you. Of course, in life, it is important to make the people around you happy, but you must focus on what you want. Now, I will go on to talk about how to break your lifetime plan down into short-term goals. But first, does anyone have any questions about what I've said so far? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a presentation by a second year environmental studies student on research into edible vaccines. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I've chosen to give my seminar presentation on a very interesting piece of appropriate technology designed to prevent sheep and goats from contracting a particularly virulent disease called Goat's Plague, which is a big problem across large parts of Africa, the Middle East and South Asia. The Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore has been working to produce genetically modified peanut plants to deliver an edible vaccine, in other words, vaccine which is given through the medium of food. In this case, it is given through genetically modified peanut leaves, which are often used as animal fodder in India. Why is edible vaccine considered much better suited to the local conditions and needs than ordinary vaccines injected by needles? Well, firstly, injected versions are very expensive to produce, whereas edible ones are cheap, which must surely be one of the most important plus factors when choosing a mode of delivery. 
Secondly, a big drawback with injected vaccines is that they easily perish when they are not kept cool. By contrast, there are far fewer problems with storing edible vaccines. They can last a long time outside a fridge. You can imagine that in remote rural areas, that is an enormous benefit. Another advantage is because this edible vaccine only contains one viral protein, it allows vets easily to pick out which animals are infected. It's apparently a common problem with injected vaccine that vets can't distinguish between sick and vaccinated animals. However, edible vaccines do have their drawbacks. The major problem is ensuring that exactly the right dose is delivered. The amounts of vaccine which develop in a given genetically modified plant differ significantly depending on the growing conditions. Obviously, too little of the protein might leave certain animals insufficiently protected. And there is also another shortcoming related to the issue of dosage of these vaccines. 99% of the protein actually perishes in the sheep or goat's stomach. We therefore cannot be sure just how much is getting through and working to protect the animal. These negative aspects really have to be addressed to ensure that animals receive maximum benefit. And finally, as with all GM crops, the transgenic peanut plants will have to be grown under strict supervision if we are to ensure that it does not contaminate peanuts grown for human consumption. Now, moving on to the next part of my seminar presentation. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.